Dus de man Dan is... zien we, hè? ja, zeker. Going live, going live. We are live. Yay. What's up, what's up? <laughs> Sounding like Bugs Bunny here. What's up, Doc? That's a great impression. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. So, so, hi, everybody. Good evening. This is our fourth live session, Timothy. Third, fourth? Um, I'm not sure. I think fourth. Oh, cool. Fourth. So, we're kind of getting a little bit into uh, flow here. Yes. That's good. That's what I, we wanted. I was, yeah, I was just in the habit of, you know, I do always this when I'm recording saxophone because I want to hear myself. <laughs> and I, I just put my <laughs> headphones on like this, like, but for, for talking, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> so it was a bit silly, but anyway, be that besides. So who's joining? Um, Yeah, put your names and and maybe where you're from in the comments we would love to know and maybe people from the last weeks are joining again or maybe it's the first time that you're on a live stream so hi in both cases (laughs) (laughs) Uh, um, yeah we want to talk today about um, what's the topic again (laughs) Um, oh yeah expanding (laughs) your your taste in music no, we did some uh, quite some uh, topics already, and um, yeah, expanding your taste in music. That's probably not a good uh, title, clickbait. Not that we do uh, clickbait or we try to do clickbait. Might sound dull if you read it, but um, I think it's important to to open your view as much as possible. Um, yeah. I don't know if people really try to do that or kind of cultivate to do that. Hmm. What's your impression, Timothy? Is that like, like my impression is that, that people rather stick with what they used to love or, or you know, mostly it, it's built up in their puberty between probably in their between 12, 20, maybe 25. That's an important period. There's also quite some research that shows that like I think like even the the 14 15 16 in your puberty is kind of the hot Mm -hmm. spot of what you kind of um, if you go to a live concert and it has a big impact on you that it stays with you for the rest for your of your life and if it's a funny thing that's for for myself it's just a sample of course that's not but they did a bigger uh, research but I can relate to that for sure I don't know if you can relate to that. Do you still like what you liked? Uh, uh, I yeah. do. I do actually. I I find myself going back to that stuff now. Like if I don't know what what to listen, I just listen to things I I used to listen. So you like? Yeah, I also find myself. Even some pop songs are, you know, that kind of are dull. But when you listen to it, uh, like the radio songs, which I generally don't like so much, but it's kind of nostalgia and you feel somehow a little bit, yeah, at least more connected to to music from that time period Mm -hmm. in your life. Even when it's like the pop songs of those days. Mm -hmm. So... It has its place for sure. I'm, I mean, it's not a bad thing that you like create or that there it all gets started. But what I feel happens after, I don't know which which age or, but people kind of get picky on their music and are really, you know, picky on their taste and, and, and all what d- doesn't fit uh, the narrative there is bad music and, mm. and stuff like that. The opposite is a little bit annoying. <laughs> no, but I, I think you said something interesting right at the, at the start. Like you have to cultivate that. You sort of mm-hmm. have to have to, yeah, really get in, sort of in the habit of 
trying to stay open to things and maybe um, sort of discover it's it's all it, we always come back to the same things but it's like discovering what you actually like about something and then yeah, finding what how that may be the case in other genres or sounds yeah and that's by the way you can already hear it uh, how it relates to transcribing as well of course <laughs> <laughs> everything <I> mean... <laughs> is transcribing <laughs> no but it's one of the good great tools to start um knowing what you like and why you like it of course so um yeah we kind of do <clears throat> did mention this before the past uh, few weeks but it's not that we are getting thousands and uh ten thousands of people uh, in the live stream so i'm not sure if we over um yeah said it yeah probably not so <laughs> so but we surely guys who are uh, watching we surely also would your would love to hear your input on this because me and T timothy talk a lot about these kind of things in private or yeah just when we uh <laughs> come to get to yeah come together and we, we tend to talk a lot about these kind of things and also like all the things r around music really um uh, like your taste and 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 how to get it that's kind of also uh you might have noticed that we if you um yeah see our email address like in the description and you want to send us a mail it's uh to info at edge effect dot media um i think there are quite some people like confused why that is like edge effect what is that uh <laughs> But that's actually our uh, company. We have a little company. Uh, and uh, Sharp 11 is a part of that. But that's kind of, um, if we have to do all the legal stuff, we have to use that name. Uh, <laughs> um, but that Edge Effect is a, a fun name Timothy came up with uh, quite some years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, means, it's a biologic term. Uh, no, uh, biodiversity yes. term, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's when two um, how is it again? Uh, two different where um, um, yeah, two or more um, different kinds of I don't know what you would call it, like vegetation. When when these things yeah, they're like there's much more diversity at the edges where those things meet than just in the middle of a forest or something like where the forest meets the river and the river meets the whatever like there's where you you'll find most diversity in a lot of stuff yeah and that's kind of the idea and i think that's so uh, yeah that's that's we figured that was an applicable uh term and thought philosophy thing for us yeah sure like like um if you keep your mind open for that kind of stuff you know a lot of different stuff um then i don't know it f serves really mm. as a very helpful creative tool i think um it, it's okay to make like pure jazz or pure folk or mm. pure anything as well but at least if you can just um, appreciate everything on its own terms. Mm. I think you have to listen to certain music also with different, yeah, uh, different expectations or you cannot expect the same from film music as from pop music mm. or it all has its function in that context, yeah. for example. And a, a lot of people already kind of kill the id already there uh, be just because of you know some dogmas um like it has to be a little bit progressive and with heavy guitars for example yeah sure and then you never can get into salsa music or <laughs> for example i you know it doesn't really matter i'm just kind of trying to throw a lot of genres but um that actually reminds me so of the, uh, of uh 
a band. I don't know if you if you know them. They they're called Opeth. They're yeah. a Swedish band, and they used to be like death metal and a lot of growls and and stuff like that. And a couple of years ago, they decided to make an album, and there was only clean singing. <laughs> and you had like half of the fans who absolutely heresy. Loved it. Yeah, the, w one half absolutely loved it, and the other half was li like. You can't do that where are the growls and blah 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 and they're still going on about that <laughs> I, I can i can i can respect something like that like they as a band they or it's it's like mostly one guy who writes all that stuff and he was mm -hmm. like if i want to continue and grow as an artist i feel like i have to make this decision and go in this direction now so I think that's a very respectable thing to do as an artist. Sure. If you want to be in the creative business, at least I think you need to look. Yeah. You want to search for those edges and to cross some <clears throat> edges. Mm -hmm. I think that's where all the interesting stuff happens. Otherwise, you kind of keep cooking the same things with the same ingre ingredients, maybe different uh, amounts of certain ingredients of different balances, but mm. uh, it's a bit. Uh, by the way, hi, uh, George, Miles, and Ephraim. Um, um, if I read that well, so um, guys, yeah, we are talking about um, now how to be creative. No, <laughs> uh, yeah, we are talking a lot of things at the same time, but we want to be want this to be really an open kind of conversation that you uh, sure surely really participate in it uh like like i said like uh for the people who joined later me and timothy we talk all the time about these kind of things like um how it comes in this case for for today we thought that would be a interesting uh topic to start at least the discussion or the yeah the conversation and it can go anywhere really but uh that a lot of people yeah, block some musical genres or even bands or yeah, a lot of music actually. Really, mm -hmm. it, it's quite hostile. <laughs> like mm -hmm. if you have sometimes um, people talking about music and what good taste is, and uh, so uh, yeah, that's so we have some thoughts on that. That's actually the core of um, why we started to. Or at least how um, our business is called, like we just said, like Edge Effect. It's literally a um, name for a idea of biodiversity. Yes. So crossing edges, that's really what it is. And that's probably also, I I at least can um, uh, attest to this. For Timothy, it's kind of, I think, kind of similar, but still with uh, a lot of uh, variation. But I like a lot of fusion music music and just because of that i think yeah fusion jazz but um just a lot of crossover genres really doesn't have to be even fusion jazz can be anything really um so yeah um i don't know if you guys have some thoughts on this already put that really in the comments um yeah that would be really cool to to discuss and how it also relates to transcribing um that's also something we do a lot um, but yeah i learned a lot from from trying to to be open to other music genres really i did a lot of stuff uh i did some if i try to yeah i did a lot of jazz stuff but besides that i played metal on with with a big band on a big s square where it's kind of um it's right off dimti uh with yes um hmm. i don't know if you were there we played like really loud metal with a big band so it made it even much louder on the place andre rieu i <laughs> hope you don't know him but he's kind of a famous guy like and the square is known for its um cheesy classical yeah it's not even classical but cheesiness <laughs> Uh, so that was fun to destroy uh, that square. Um, yeah, I do some Latin bands uh, as well. Uh, 
I don't know. I did a lot of different things. Uh, also some some classical uh, with a classical orchestra. I had to do soprano solo, which was really, really fun. It was kind of a complete different world, uh, different. Um, yeah, a different culture to join. Did you did you have uh, to play in a section or was it just you solo? No. Oh, OK. I, I, I was like the soloist. It was like a one and a half hour ish uh, piece. Really beautiful. Kind of, um, I would, it's, it was classical music, was a bit in the Irish folk ish feel. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were like, I think 12 parts. And I had to play in part three <laughs> and part 11, I think. <laughs> yeah, but it was really, I had to play some yeah, soprano solo. Um, and also those rehearsals. So you're there and they're like rehearsing with a choir and stuff like that. And you kind of have to do nothing for like almost an hour. And then suddenly you you really need to be present, present, you know, but also it just, I, I was used to pl improvisation. That was not the problem. I, I was doing that every week and in jazz settings and you, you kind of vomit your way <laughs> through changes. <laughs> so that, that was pretty okay. And then you come in that, that classical uh, environment uh, where they also want you to improvise and it was like the first part I, I remember were two different kind of parts like the first one was a really open I like uh, a very epic kind of yeah uh, soundscape ish one chord thing mm. um, and we played also in like a big classical room you know the the, the reverberation like the, the typical concert room for for classical music and um i know like i hit it like a f sharp I, I i still know which note like that was the it was on d major or something and i played it quite quietly even because i wanted to you know make sure i was kind of doing inside before before i maybe explored a bit further but um it had so much impact there were like strings on the bottom and then it was like whoops whoa that you know it sounds already this note sounds like this and this it sounded amazing but i had to be so carefully with every note choice and with every intonation mm -hmm. as well and i i felt uh, kind of naked there <laughs> almost <laughs> you know but it was amazing it was really amazing it was really scary but also amazing yeah. um to experience so um that's cool yeah that, that was just just something that comes to mind um um oh uh, yeah there was improvisation but in a completely different context mm. and it's it's really interesting to do it in a jazz context as well it's really different different game different rules mm. almost yeah that's kind of the thing like there you have jazz and it has it's kind of rules so to speak and then you have a classical setting which has its kind of rules and what's what's the word mm. like conventions sort of yeah like it's really a different culture mm. and conventions and it so it's like like a subset of of yeah if we live in belgium like that's western europe if uh, i went to brazil to uh, Rio de Janeiro, it was completely a different culture, mm -hmm. different way of life, um, which was interesting. But it, if I would try to go and live there, I would need to adapt a lot of things mm -hmm. in daily habits even. Um, by the way, George is um, having a very interesting um, question. Uh, so let me read it and then I'm trying to create my personal style this period. That's cool. Like, uh, do I kind of assume by that, like in the pandemic times, you're open some time to really explore more of your own style and before not so much. I don't know. That's just kind of how I'm maybe reading that sentence. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm sp studying specific things that uh, my heroes uh, are doing that's extremely hard many times <laughs> um, yeah I think if you study enough of your heroes 
transcribe or doesn't have to be literal. That's also another uh, thing to discuss, but it's also certainly uh, really interesting to try to play along with like the recording. For example, I tried that with Cannonball and tried to capture the intensity in the way of phrasing and just the, the intention of the line hmm. and the abstract concepts of the line without copying the line. It wasn't also the. It's not that I was trying to uh, transcribe in real time or anything. I didn't really try to copy it if I played something. I tried to go for the, yeah, the overall sound, which was more in the phrasing and stuff. But that's a different uh, concept. Um, but I think, at least if you, I hope you have plenty of euros, um, and if you then go and kind of pick whatever you like and the concepts and not the exact lines and you start to go if you have three four different heroes with three four different concepts and you also try to rework them your own way i mean then you are already um really unique in your own style probably maybe that's a little bit simplistic but I really think it does work like that. We also say everybody is authentic, like, mm -hmm. I mean, as a person. Um, well, not that English is my native uh, language, but we all talk the same language. We have the same words and the same grammar and everything. Uh, but you st everybody kind of uses it in their own way of, of communicating something. So you can be still very authentic with that. You're still communicating your own thoughts and, and concepts, even though we're all using the same language. Yeah. And But it's certainly interesting also in language just to, to, to see and, and explore those that inspire you also with language or as a person and, and just observe. I think we do this naturally anyway. You know, I have an eight-month-old. Uh, yeah, he's a baby still, but I think he, he got really big, so I'm not calling him baby anymore. <laughs> but he, uh, and he observes everything, really everything in the world. Like, I, I, I it's hard to explain, but he, like everything he has, he, he noticed everything that happens. Uh, so he is already really observing me mm. and and his mother, of course. I mean, um, so and he will continue to do that. And I hope you don't lose that at a certain age. Mm. I think some people kind of uh, after so everybody did this naturally. And probably at some point you're maybe just l probably satisfied what, with what you kind of picked up and you have already a way of looking at the world and then it doesn't I don't know what what it would be why it would stop I'm not sure why, why people stop <laughs> some people I think um, it's it's sort of habituation mm -hmm. like you, you've seen it but yeah no go on sorry but the habit is like kind of the the default habit that you get from baby, like they all learn, they, they are learning machines. No, no. So that's kind of the default habit. Habit. No, not, not like for a long time. Like ha habituation is like you, you become, uh, uh, if something smells really bad after a while, oh, you don't okay. smell it anymore. Oh yeah. So, oh, so the yeah. things that, 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 that are constant, the... they, they kind of blur. Yeah. You get numb to the yeah. I think I think it's balance. something like that, and then you have to, I think, more uh, be a little more proactive if to or to to be more aware of it, to be more aware <laughs> or to stay more aware, to observe more. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm trying to form a decent sentence but i'm i'm failing at it <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah but i think that's why it's it's really um it always stays in don't it's like doing research i i've said that many times before but like um 
like a transcription, a specific transcription is a research on, if I do Michael Brecker, it's a research on Michael Brecker at that moment <laughs> and point in time in his life mm -hmm. also. Uh, but I hope when you do research and you do a good research for, um, if you're writing a paper or anything, doing a major research, then a good research at least consists of multiple sources. Mm -hmm. If you have just one source or two sources, it's probably not going to be uh, greatly uh, or, or accepted as a very good research for, for some good reasons, mm -hmm. uh, because you don't have enough information to add up like from different points of, and the very good research is also the anti uh, thesis. That's also a very interesting uh, thing of, I kind of started doing this, you know, uh, I can, I started to transcribe people I don't like, um, or don't like is also when you kind of start to become open about it, or you start to question why you don't like a certain player, it kind of, uh, doesn't hold up long anymore. <laughs> I found at least, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, David Sanborn and Timothy knows this. For me, the sound, it's a specific sound uh, and it was not for me. You know, I like bright sounds, but for me, David Sanborn was just, I really couldn't stand the, the sound of it. Um, so I never transcribed Sanborn. I also never really, you know, went to look for more Sanborn. I listen, you also get really uh, decided mostly by one or two examples. And if you don't like it, then you don't go to look for um, other mm -hmm. stuff of that uh, person, which is completely normal, of course, but it also closes your view a lot because as we know, we also don't play always our best concerts or or play differently or different situations can give different outcomes and there are so many uh, different things that can occur but once I could uh, uh, for a moment throw off that um, that thought of David Samborn I don't like his sound let's check out a bit more I kind of um, got it forced upon me because I like the Brecker brothers I went into the old stuff of the Brecker brothers and who was there David Samborn and I thought already, like, oh, that's Sam Warren. He played a solo also somewhere. And I liked his sound much more. Not yet that was, like, absolutely my taste, but it was completely different from what I initially had, um, yeah, had, had heard him the first time do. So that was already uh, different. Still, it wasn't, like, my my ideal sound on saxophone. But then I thought, like, yeah, but there is not only sound to it on saxophone there is also something like like if you study improvisation concepts of uh improvisation with what what kind of lines which kind of rhythms which kind of phrasing does he use and then i did the rocks solo where like david sambor and, and um michael brecker uh, does some some gradings um and i i really liked it I really liked what I transcribed, although I factually could say, like, if you compare both of them, and, and David would probably, I, I read an uh, article about that, uh, where David said about that recording, he said it was horrendous to do trade force with him, you know, <laughs> because, you know, you, you, you knew just Michael would, he could play funky and, and David as well, but then he had, you know, this wide range of, of outside and, and special, you know, lines. Uh, he never could, but um, he stayed to his personal way of playing and, and you can hear like Brecker going like one time, big time, he goes like super wide into Brecker mode with his concerts, but he, he does the David thing and, and, and uh, he does that well. And um, it would be really bad there if he, after that round of four, bars of David uh, David Brecker. Uh, <laughs> Michael Brecker would start to also play random stuff he couldn't actually do, mm -hmm. but kind of because Michael Brecker did something, he had to answer with something, you know, crazy. 
fast. But um, once I could get rid of the sound, and by the way, there is another saxophone player that comes to mind for this, um, Benny Carter. Um, I never checked out some Benny Carter for real because I didn't really like like the, for me, a little bit of pinched sound. It was like a squeezy sound, but I have a great student um, on Skype, Sai Schmidt. He showed me, he said like, you have to check this out, something from Benny Carter. And I actually did it for longer than 10 seconds. <laughs> and then I was blown away by his timing, his ideas, his, his hugely unique way of playing in an old school way and then the sound um i don't know it kind of all started to fit it didn't annoy me anymore after a while i started to like it and and a lot of great things have happened since i tried really try to cultivate to start listening to people i don't like mm. so much or like I, I i actually shouldn't say it like that anymore which i initial my initial response is not one of um, I want to check that out more. I should rephrase that mm -hmm. with a more beautiful <laughs> sentence. Uh, uh, I see John Skamnakis. Hello from Greece. I, hey, hello from Belgium. Uh, my heroes are very different and my personal style tends to become Frankensteinish. That's great. Uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, sure. Uh, for me too, for example, I love Desmond's melodic lines, but I love Sam Morton Stone. Um, yeah, but I can relate. I love, as you might know by the amount of Desmond transcriptions, I love hugely Paul Desmond. I was once addicted to Paul Desmond, <laughs> you know. Um, but I love a lot of fusion and, and maybe not Sam Morton is my number one of choice. I'm more in for alto on Eric Marental, I like his sound or tenor uh, Brecker, but still that's miles apart from, from Desmond, but that's okay. That's kind of the point. You can like other things for different reasons. And I, I would, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I just want, I just wanted to say like, yeah, you, you already have like, you like the melodic lines of this person and you like the, the tone of that person and that combination automatically already is starting to become your own style. Sure. By the way, um, and, and the weird thing is I also really like Paul Desmond's sound. I mean, it's really different from, from, yeah. Uh, for <clears throat> me, always the scale for, for sound, um, is like on the one side you have Paul Desmond, the other side, David Sanborn, and all the others are in between, kind hmm. of, you know, like bright, vs, uh, mellow. Um, and I like a lot of people on the on the. Like my sound is probably also rather on the other side of the spectrum towards the, the David Sanborn and but not really David Sanborn, but uh, like on an eight of ten, uh, uh, like an eight out of ten on a David Sanborn scale, where <laughs> Sanborn is ten. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> on a scale of um, one to Sanborn yeah, yeah something like that but um, yeah but that's I don't know that that's really great I think I, I, I do dig some old school players as well for their for their mellow sound and I dig some for their them bright sound and some have a good combination in between so um, yeah <laughs> yeah, you surely could play Samba Cantina with a di different uh, with Sanborn Stone, but I don't know. Probably Sanborn lovers wouldn't like it. Hmm. But that doesn't. I mean, but that doesn't really matter, does it? Yeah. So, like, some styles have their also their kind of dogmas. I don't know how to otherwise call it. It's Bossa Samba Candi Cantina. It's called samba, but it's I think rather a bossa. But and and bossas and Brazilian music tend tends to be really introverted and really mellow. And so David Sanborn is the other spectrum, and that's kind of people would not like it because it's yeah, uh, it's kind of incompatible to the 
dogmatic sound. No, that sounds way worse, but there is a certain stylistic aspect that wouldn't fit the narrative. Hmm. But I don't think we should, if everybody keeps doing that, then sure, but yeah. It just could work or it could work for some people and that's more than enough. At least try it out for sure. That's the least you can do. Maybe it's just like a matter of intensity. Like the Sanborn's tone would be too intense, but then you have to match the rest of the ensemble to maybe make it work. So you're still playing the song, but you sort of have to make it fit. The thing... The thing is, and that's more of a, a saxophonistic uh, view of it, but uh, David Samborn plays a, a mouthpiece that is not really fit for s soft playing. <laughs> like, you literally have a hard time playing. Like, if you... Then it's... <laughs> like, yeah, it has, like, a dynamic, like, like a acceleration, a, a high baffle in the mouthpiece, which accelerates the air, which makes it more bright and and also louder <laughs> so that it's a good point you make so that that makes for a practical um a little bit of difficulty already there but yeah sure if you could like um i could try it <laughs> i actually by the way once you know i have like timothy knows i have ten thousands of ids uh for for arrangements and new tunes and stuff i want to do uh and i can do only one at a time but uh, Samba Cantina is surely one I want to do um, once in a kind of arrangement, uh, not as an exact cover. Probably, I think that's a bit dull. I don't. I am by far not Paul Desmond, but um, but I love the tune. So so maybe you will hear me doing that uh, once with my rather bright uh, mouthpiece. So. I'm not sure everything can be transferred, George, uh, George says. Uh, everything can be transferred as in... Yeah, I, did, did you read his uh, comment above that? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> um, um... Oh, that's a funny one. You should be able to respond to that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I know the feeling like saxophone lines that's something we i think we discussed it before probably in some video but like saxophone phrases work very well on saxophone but they don't necessarily work very well on guitar for instance like they're very interesting to 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 explore um but it won't automatically sound as good as if a saxophone player would play them. And but can I, yeah, can I be a little bit uh, devil's advocate here? Sure. Like we did, um, we did the cannonball. You did the cannonball uh, on on guitar and uh, Michael Brecker. And I thought I think they both both sounded really cool on guitar. Uh, sure. It, it, like it, it's not Im impossible to to do or or yeah, it's it's a vague vague area I have to uh... yeah some things probably work and some things don't I I tried to do some hold sort on saxophone like vice first it's I could I can say it's practical yeah that that's um, I think that's sort of the main thing like they don't they don't lie very well on the guitar necessarily like saxophone lines they they jump around in places where a, as you, if you would play them as a guitar line you wouldn't naturally go to those places and i no but yeah that's the same for for saxophone as well when you do the the opposite direction mm -hmm. so it's hard and it's also but i think it's interesting because it's also the culture of your instrument that kind of puts you in a direction because that's I, I i've played um about 20 years mostly probably 95 percent of of specifically composed by saxophone players for saxophone players 
or like transcriptions, like uh, really sucks phone lines. Um, it's hard to tell if it's, it's probably a bit of both, but it's hard to tell if I would now do 10 years of Alan Holtzworth or guitar lines, maybe they become also, probably they become more natural to me, even on the saxophone. I think it's also um, a matter of the phrasing. Sure. Like the way it's... And, and like... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, like like uh, in the end, George, uh, no, not everything can be transferred. For sure not, but there are like you, plenty of interesting places. You can... I think most things can be transferred, like in terms of playability, but you have to adapt it to your instrument. Like you can play saxophone, saxophone lines on guitar, but you'll have to come up with, with a way of playing them that they will sound good on guitar, like actual playing wise. Maybe you have to change your way of attack, how you pick the note or how you play the legato stuff or uh, the sound you're yeah. using so that yeah you just sort of adapt that aspect to make them work if that makes sense yeah yeah surely i mean it's it's um like like let's assume you manage to get the notes down that's like easy or or you can really play the line itself but you think like it still doesn't sound so good so yeah then there is for sure that um, that phrasing and, and tone matching uh, thing, um, which I think naturally, I like that a lot. Uh, alto or tenor or soprano saxophone, even uh, unisono or in in harmonies uh, playing together. I really love the sound of, of uh, certainly, um, I think they add up very well. Look at the Chicory Electric Band. Uh, I like that sound. That's taste, of course, but I think they blend very uh, good there. Um, but still, um, for example, the phrasing thing is a really different. It's a good aspect. You you talk about that because, like the Holtzworth, um, you made it really easy easier to uh, mention just one thing, which apparently is a thing um, Holtzworth had to study a long time for because he wanted to copy ironically saxophone players he he want he made everything as legato as he could because he thought, thought uh horn players were so legato but the funny thing is as a saxophone player if you play like for example bebop or just swing or anything jazz related even if it's more straight the saxophone players the jazz players like brecker will play like Da, 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 da. but their tongue like they will um, tongue every other uh, note like the second they connect to the third one and then the fourth one to the first one and like that to get the off beats um, a little bit more accentuated so that was I was doing that as well you put a lot of effort in studying that to get a good sound you know to sound well within the genre and I was studying um, uh Alan Holtzworth, and I was doing this as well, also with his fast lines, and and then with the, even the faster lines, you kind of aim for it in a bebop-like fashion that you discriminate a little bit more in, like you go more for the highest note of the line to, yeah, and with half tonguing, you know, with ghosting notes and stuff like that. And then Timothy said, like after like a few weeks of studying it, it was hard, really hard to get, certainly to get that on tempo, because you're like, uh, if he does like also that five tuplet thing, your offbeat tonguing doesn't, <laughs> you know, it, it, it doesn't uh, fit anymore, you know, so it was a hard thing. And and then Timothy said, yeah, but um, like yeah, Alan Holzer really tried to sound like a saxophone player. He made everything so legato. And then I, I felt like, wait a minute. Yeah, let's listen to again. Oh yeah, that's super legato. Why am I actually putting my tongue to that saxophone? Just keep, <laughs> just low leg. For me, it, then I started playing legato and it sounded a ten times better. Just legato. I didn't have to worry about the phrasing, which made it much more easier. So only my fingers had to be in time. My tongue didn't have to be even a part of it. Great. <laughs> and it sounded way better. So 
Yeah, phrasing is a lot. And also uh, with the cannonball. So, George, uh, we were referring to a few. We did a few solo cover, solo transcription covers. One of them is uh, Cannonball's Oleo solo, Life at the Plaza with Miles. It's a very fast one. Um, you can check that one. That's like typical bebop style, very fast. Timothy, uh, I thought I thought it sounded great on guitar with a little bit of distortion. Yeah. You know, it, it sounded really nice also then with the alto. And then, uh, but for me, even, I mean, it was played on alto, but it was really hard to play. It was really fast. But then you have even Cannonball was like at, 320 bpm rushing <laughs> it's insane you really played in front there um and some lines were really hard to play until um i i only could tackle it by listening to the phrasing i i w- went to the phrasing at those difficult spots and then i thought like oh he's ghosting that and he's emphasizing that and if i do that right with my tongue and then suddenly it 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 became logical than line and it also became playable uh instantly so it's phrasing is a really underestimated part and like intention phrasing um of playing and trying to sound together blending with each other um so uh go for for the uh yeah phrasing is a is a big part and it's hard to copy over some yeah over the instruments mm-hmm. uh, I think one last thing, maybe like for guitar specifically, you could, I, I don't know how, what your style of playing is obviously, but um, like, if you like that whole sword kind of thing, emulating saxophone, it's a very horizontal way of playing. So all of the shapes are very much like multiple notes on one string. Um, whereas the, the counterpart of that is very vertical. So you have a lot of single notes on one string or two notes, and that makes it sound, um, well, if you're playing vertical, it'll sound a a bit more staccato because you have to keep picking every new string, every new note. But if you play more in a horizontal way, you'll get more of that fluent legato thing going on. So you could experiment with that, just playing in a more horizontal way. Yeah, but even yeah. like, yeah, and now I think of Scott Henderson, like, that's, again, the whole opposite way that's that's very bluesy, very digging deep in the strings, and that's that also sounds cool, so y- you have a very wide spectrum you can explore. Sure, and and by the way, one one thing that I, uh, what you say about this vertical playing, I, I really recognize this as a saxophone player i think one uh, when i start like that really opened for me my eyes when i started doing that um what was it sarah beth from uh holdsworth that uh, saxophone players are so chromatic and so so uh yeah playing in seconds like a half note or a whole tone like they they we follow really in, indeed that linear pattern and sometimes some arpeggios but fourths or fifths jumps or mm. or sixth jumps or seven jumps or octave jumps and that's kind of stuff that that's really not so common uh to use on a saxophone. That's not the idiom if you would look at Charlie Parker or where most people are coming from in the jazz world. Uh, most people you know, follow the same kind of culture, which, which, which of course has its um, uh, logical reasons, but you end up also in a really similar, I, I really uh, dislike this of my own playing or I try to fix it. No, that's not the word, but I, I think I play too to chromatic uh, and that's not that i'm only playing chromatic lines but i it's really yeah in seconds or half tones so that's a lot of the the vocabulary of a of a, of a saxophone player and it's hard to and in eight notes like the the, the bebop tradition just like and then then up the scale down the scale with chromatic passing tones that's basically every saxophone player <laughs> And then 
you know, I, I, there, there was, but also the chroma, chromaticism, um, because then you had Holtzroyd, and he was playing also at points quite inside, but there were not so many chromatic passing tones. For me, it was like, oh, 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 it's all diatonic. Mm. Oh, kind of. Mm -hmm. And then you played outside, and then it was in uh, augmented, so still no or, or, or augmented shapes, so still no chromaticism. So, you know, that's that's... Was and he had some chromatic lines, but but like the majority of it wasn't like that. And if there were patterns that were more in in, in seconds, or they, they, there were some, but they were shaped quite differently than than any saxophone player. If that makes sense, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> Ornet lost from above. Yeah, Ornet was really. And of course, yeah, that was one of the really saxophone players to go really off road there, which was cool, of course. Um, uh, even you have Eddie Harris, which, who was in a different style, a little bit like that too, I think. He really uh, started playing with, with larger than the octave drums on the saxophone, uh, really large drums in lines, uh, which was really liberating uh, in a way. Um, I don't know many, most people really, you can tell 90% of the saxophone players have this big bebop background. So I think for saxophone players, there is a lot of, yeah, a lot of space to explore. And you still can come from a bebop background. I mean, me, most do, but you can keep that, keep that. But even within that logic, you can um, really open up. So I don't know if there is kind of a similar, uh, yeah, approach on guitar, or if you have like, like if you have to narrow it down. This was of course very simplistic and very general, but um, it's a bit what I also I did so many soul transcriptions, in a way, also some blues lines of course in between and stuff like that, and 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 a lot of um, harmonic minor and stuff like that, but. But it kind of fits that same narrative. I don't know if if there is in in the for you on guitar you have a few like biases or yeah um, guitarists tend to take. Um, hmm. My my own experience was like we get pushed into well pushed you you come across the advice to check out uh, saxophone players very early on in my experience. So, and I, for me, it was uh, just too soon and I had to explore guitar itself and guitar players first more because I when also went for all the Charlie Parker stuff and the Omni book and blah, 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 blah. But I, <laughs> you learn a bit from it, but you can't really make it work or you can't, you're not, it's not taking you to a higher level or it, it wasn't taking me to a, to a higher level. And it wasn't until Eduardo said like, go transcribe Jimi Hendrix go transcribe like the old blues guys or whatever and then was like oh shit there's a whole area i just don't know about playing guitar like i can't i can play it technically but it it wasn't part of of my playing because i didn't really i hadn't checked that out and then i went on to to transcribe all the joe pass stuff and then it's like oh i'm starting to know and learn my guitar better and now i'm actually starting to become a guitar player instead of a guitar player who is just trying to play saxophone on the guitar or something and if you then then go and explore other instruments it's going to make more sense and you can sort of incorporate that but i i for a long time i sort of lacked that um 
I don't know, like like you have like the essential licks for saxophone players, the essential Parker licks. Like I I lack the essential guitar stuff or basics or whatever. So I think maybe we as guitar players can focus a bit more actually on other guitar players and our own tradition as as an instrument. But I just told you that we saxophonists did this and this was actually causing too much of <laughs> the same kind of lines. No, but uh, I know what you mean, of course. But I think also there it just... It, there, there is this tradition and there is... I think music education is great and not great in the same at the same time because of this it's great it's great that you can have you know a little bit of guidance towards um and there and there is really a use in it's not completely bogus to go with some with charlie parker or anything mm. of course not but then from that point on there is also much more to explore uh like like also like you could uh, on guitar learn saxophone lines but also piano lines mm -hmm. or piano voicings or 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 like i tried some chicoria uh, solos on 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 saxophone that's really interesting it's like you then you start to see when you know your own culture so i think you need to know this a little bit to just know one language at least kind of uh, basic mm -hmm. otherwise you don't have anything to compare with also and also because it just is built for your instrument. But once you are able to do that, surely explore all those other uh, paths and, and like piano solos or, or anything. Like you transcribe the Duduk on, on, on Tigran, which I really picked a lot. I, I love the sound. I love the lines. I love the different kind of, yeah, dynamic approach that instrument had as which is probably very instrument specific mm -hmm. uh yeah so so then we should i think be motivated and a good teacher would really motivate to to go and explore much further mm -hmm. but i think that's what make makes by the way for example chikoria really unique in one part he also talks about this that he he was a drummer and he played drum jazz gigs until his 19th and then he changed for real to become a piano player and he he does some also of those comping stuff he thinks of them as drum patterns and like drumming with every finger and you really can hear that and that's really a, a part of his player that you which sets him apart mm -hmm. it's a little little specific yeah, example sure. i just thought of but it's, it's like i think it's also a bit different uh like for piano or guitar like we also have to play chords so it's not only single lines and it's no, it's, sure. it's kind of important that you know that aspect too so at some point you do have to well you don't have to do anything but i think it's 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 beneficial if you learn that stuff too like the specific voicings you can play any voicing on the guitar like you would play on the piano and vice versa so all that stuff, like, that, that's what I meant by knowing your own culture first or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, but that's perfectly, perfectly fine to know your own culture. There is nothing wrong with that. But somehow people get stuck, I think. Mm -hmm. It's not so many people who go from that point. Then they are already in that culture and they are, like, mostly trying to maintain the culture and like like every intruder or every you know everyone who tries to break free from that uh it it makes a little bit for a tribe mm -hmm. also almost uh there at that point people really start yeah i i remember sure, i yeah. think i read sometime that uh coltrane at one point was studying harp stuff oh yeah yeah they I think that enforced this sheets of sound yeah. uh, ID. Right. And what John, what you're saying um, is really true. I mean, if you write, you, you really can almost tell mostly 
uh, when when a tune is written by a guitar player or maybe by a saxophone player or, or or by a singer or you know those patterns always come back because that also mostly fits the instrument of course which is also really okay of course if i try to write something specific for saxophone i also choose a key or a range where it's you know every note for me on the saxophone has a little bit different timbre a different edge or a different so that's the same on the guitar with those open strings so you make sure you kind of you compose so you want it to fit your id of course um and a very ex- example of this is for example uh, mike stern's chromosome hmm. remember timothy we played that uh, and if you play that on the saxophone there are so few places to breathe like and then just so there is it's just insane it, you really feel this and i i've played with many guitar players that also compose and this is not a dig at you to be, uh, necessarily <laughs> Also, but not 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 specifically you, but I, ha- but I have like, been guilty of this too. Yes, <laughs> um, you know that you kind of uh, go. I I am still a little bit purple, by the way, <laughs> even on this video. But you go purple because of the line that takes so so long, and there are not so many breathing points, which can be cool. I mean, for the effect of a certain melody, I don't say. I, I don't necessarily say that's a bad thing. Like uh, I know a lot of people would say, like to guitar players, yeah, but a horn player couldn't play, play that because you, uh, you have to make a melodic sentence. Is like if you should be able to sing it with one breath or something like mm-hmm. along those lines, which I don't totally. Yeah, we talked about this last week. I think like what is a good melody? Uh, yeah, that can be one way of looking at what a good melody is so that it's not longer than four bars or eight bars that's basically what you're saying and that the melody is not too long so you can comprehend it (laughs) so like the initial statement that's what basically happens then yeah sure but but it's also cool to have a melody that maybe just doesn't stop in a in a way i think that's a very cool uh it's all different kind of approaches, but I never would say like, like a lot of people have those preset minds for what a good melody is, and um, I, I just only sometimes have practical limitations to those <laughs> ideas. You know, that's the only thing. But <laughs> it kind of remi- it actually reminds me of an of an uh, a tune by Ennio Morricone. Like I, I can come come up with the title right now but it, it's it has like one of these melodies that just it just keeps going and going and going and it's pretty angular but it sounds so cool and it's it has this unexpected feeling even though it keeps going on that's what makes it like oh we're still going oh we're still going like he keeps pushing it forward i think mm-hmm. it, it can be really cool but everything can be really cool, like a very, very minimalistic m- melody or open everything, like decide your own rules. Um, just be clear about your own intention. I, th- I, I think I, I, that's something we all mostly like when we listen to music, if the intention is clear. Yes. Even if it's fakey music, I mean, if it's intended to be really open and not... I mean, but then also you can be really uh, clear about the intention of the music. It's, it's kind of like listening to someone speak. Like it, it's much much more enjoyable to listen to someone who has come up with with some concepts or whatever, and is just talking very clearly about something and has something to say and has thought about stuff and just wants to mm-hmm. bring a message than someone who's I don't know. So maybe this or maybe that i'm not sure or you are have you ever been in the situation and i'm talking to you Timothy, but also <laughs> to you guys uh watching by the way really join the conversation i really dig the questions we've got so far from george and john um they are great um but did you ever had the experience that you were listening to somebody 
maybe it was political or it doesn't really matter or or or, or from a music standpoint or like a different angle and that was like so eloquent and so uh, clear in their message that you even though you naturally don't share their beliefs that for that moment for a moment that you were kind of in their ideas like you were more open or like you you kind of like oh yeah that that's okay it's, a, it's maybe this is a, is a bad way to kind of i hope you you understand what i try to yeah yeah, yeah. no no i i know what you what you mean like like sort of it, i have kind of experienced that but uh i'm not sure if it was necessarily due because they they were speaking well maybe it, it was because of that but mm -hmm. like at, at one point you okay maybe you're not agreeing or something but you sort of do have that thought of I can respect what you're saying like okay I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I understand yeah. I understand your point but I don't totally agree yeah sure but exactly that but not that you afterwards completely change your view but you know at the point at that point of time you really can follow their story and their yeah. point of view and and you just completely understand not that you're necessary i have this in in a this is kind of a we talk a lot of in, in analogies you've probably noticed but i think that's really music refers to to everything that happens in in life and in culture um but i've i've been like since i've tried to be more open also to music i've been to pop concerts <laughs> no i've i've been to um more specifically a, a like just a pop concert i've um uh yeah drove far even for that uh you were there too by the way Tanti. oh really in uh in amsterdam oscar and the wolf oh yeah yeah that's all, already five years ago or something really? and that's like music oh, shit. yes <laughs> because it was together at a specific date that recently came up with uh some of the terrorist attacks in 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 paris and that was five years oh, ago. And then also yeah. I thought like, whoa, but that besides that, um, it, well, it's pop music. It's electronic, dark pop music or whatever uh, I have to call it. There is a very good friend of ours that plays in it. That also produces, uh, the music for a big part, or at least he makes also a lot of the synth sounds. Um, and I don't really dig the music itself so much or not the singing really i don't think a lot of singing anyways but uh or all the fancy pop stuff weren't fancy chords in it but we went and i had a lot of fun watching the complete concert i'm glad we t took the two and a half hour drive to watch that um i digged a lot of the synth sounds and bass sounds just the sounds in general so i really appreciated the concert for that mm -hmm. um I just didn't want in what, um, you know, I knew what I could expect, of course, and I really enjoyed it on its own terms. Mm -hmm. I watched Björk, Björk as well, that comes to mind on a pop festival. It's really not my music. I never really went after that and tried to search what I've listened to and seen at that moment, but I really enjoyed it in that moment. Um, if you know what what I mean, mm -hmm. like it's just a, a, an artist is like I always see like my own music, for example, with Shrub Eleven Electric Band, what we do now, or I do also stuff besides that. But it's just the world according to you, mm -hmm. and sometimes you you can display that, and then other artists that's the world according to them, and they display it, and then then you just see a little story. Mm -hmm. It's nothing more than that, actually. Uh, so that's why I really would welcome people to be really more open-minded. And, and I really didn't like electronic music until I was like 19 or 20. I was really close for that. And uh, I don't know actually what really 
um, I think also a mutual mutual f- friend of ours, Mark, kind of showed me stuff, and really also you know told me where to pay attention to a bit mm-hmm. you know, uh, like for example most people don't dig jazz but that's also because they don't get the game they don't mm-hmm. get what it's about what what people are doing what their and what the intention is what what the mutual set of rules are if you don't know the rules of a game you cannot like the game Mm -hmm. Uh, so also that just maybe try to know the rules of the game or not or but just try to accept it at least on its own merits yeah that's i that's i think that's that's one of the biggest things of this whole thing like don't expect like you know you're going to a pop concert don't expect to hear i don't know outside lines lines over changes I, whatever but if yeah if or, or heavy chords or, or anything yeah yeah and and like you enjoyed the synth stuff and that's something you could then take away from that like you're you have yeah, you have a new appreciation exactly. for synths and now you want to incorporate that in your own stuff and explore that a bit more and you're open it, to more electronic music and it's it, it was the inspiration it's not that everything um stayed intact uh, of that inspiration but uh, there were the, actually that concert was the inspiration for example for uh yeah darth vader the the tune or on the on the album you know the impact um that some of those sub bass sounds had and not only sub it was also it's not like it was trap music or anything but uh really i thought it was cool i felt like whoa i want to use that Mm -hmm. also in my kind of all the other things i like in in music uh with saxophones and stuff like that so yeah uh especially that do that and some some do that really great today some there are quite some artists that really know how to merge those um yeah interests today like Noah, for example is pretty good at that mm-hmm. they like the 80s uh synth sound but they also like some weird jazz chord progressions you know and if you combine those i think that's great mm-hmm. For example, also just a small ID, but just two little IDs out of two different um, contexts and those merge that can be already just the concept of a band, yeah. of a sound. So, yes, the, the, that's for people that are joining later. Uh, um, we are kind of ranting about... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, taste. listening to a lot of music, taste, but but how to be more open to to get not not get stuck in your taste. I think taste is a weird thing. It's dogma hmm. mostly taste. Like what helped helped me was sort of think in terms of uh, the elements that I like that I liked. Like I come from yeah. a metal background. I have my old school Metallica shirt here. But the thing that you, you have to do a little bit of self uh, analysis, but the thing that I, the things that I liked from metal was the intensity of it. And in some bands, mm-hmm. like the rhythmic aspect of it, of it. And those are things you can find in other genres as well. Like electronic music can have very intense stuff in there as well. Or uh, like Miguel Zanon's, uh Olasi, whatever, like the, yeah, the yeah. whole rhythmical Olasi quintuplet arenas. thing, and and like it's so so the woodwinds, yes, the colors, and the woodwinds there. There's just so many different aspects which that you can find across any genre, or like pop music. Yeah. I don't necessarily like the compositions or anything, but if I listen to it, I just think like, man, it sounds it, this stuff sounds good like the production is just ridiculous yeah the, the, yeah and the layers with the synths or whatever or the kick or 
anything or the vocals with the reverb and blah 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 it can can be anything but it's just like little points of appreciation even though you don't necessarily like everything about it yeah so that's kind of a direct question to you guys um how much do you question yourself about your taste like i i think you should at least ask tw twice or three times the question why hmm. did you like something I like, you said, metal, or I like a specific tune or a specific part of a tune. Like, for example, like heavy layered gu guitars rhythmically with a heavy drums. <laughs> I don't know, something like that. Um, okay, why do you like that? Yeah, because the guitars are heavy. Okay, uh, so everything that has a heavy guitar sound can be long notes, long chords. You'd like that too? No, probably, maybe not. You know, can be that, but yeah, because they play with so much intention and with with those, you know, it's oh, okay, it's sixteenth rhythms with also some rests, and I really like. It's also really variating across two bars. It's not like it's a pattern of of two beats or one beat it it's not a one beat ostinato it's a two bar so it's you know it's a longer story rhythmically okay then you have already more of an abstract knowledge about what you like about that or uh, there are so many ways to kind of look at it but you should really ask yourself why do i like this music um why do i like paul desmond's lines why uh, he he plays like like a class, classical musician, but with a with a jazz sound. Uh, actually, like he's like uh, Beethoven or Bach with with a jazz saxophone, you know, uh, something like that. He he plays really with that intensity, or he creates melodies m way more horizontal than any bebop player would play. And that this is not dissing bebop players at all. I like bebop on its own merits, but it's a complete different approach to for me even improvisation than also Michael Brecker or Eric Marienthal who I all dig for their own reasons mm -hmm. uh, that's just one one aspect that's the the melodical aspect I do like his phrasing Paul Desmond is really underestimated for his phrasing check it out it's insane I don't think I I cannot really match it it's it's somehow laid back somehow straight somehow really in between the lines of of a steady rhythmic um his flow is like he can lay back go forward he can go everywhere but he's really steady at the same time and he com combinates that with all those aforementioned uh, sequences and stuff like that um it's insane for me so that that's what i like about uh, paul desmond um that he can see make it seem so effortless mm -hmm. but like even hardcore progressions like the duke comes to mind it's uh, try to improvise over that you know it's like every two beats there's different chords with different tonal center almost you know and he plays I could sing that solo when I heard it when I was 16 and had no clue what he was doing. I, I thought it were easy chords. <laughs> uh, he made it sound easy chords. He he knew how to connect different tonal sanders. Yeah, in a melodic sense, in a sequential sense. Um, so that's all more specific. Uh, uh, George said, says like, well, I like a lot of things and that's the thing I'm studying. My, I like a lot of the compact, uh, concepts of Charlie Parker. Yeah, but which concepts do you like? Are there specific parts or is it everything? And if it can be everything, but is it like general way, uh, like also the balance of how many times he's kind of double time. And uh, I know the solo, I know it not perfectly by heart. So maybe I'm saying, uh, strange things it's also more as an example of of course is he playing probably inside is he playing um a lot of like those like those triplet upbeats going upwards or is he playing triplets going downwards it's completely different you know 
um, or what is he doing um, really like melodically and rhythmically and intentionally um, uh, yeah that are quite some some concrete questions you should if you are serious about yourself I think you should ask those questions to that's only just to know learn to know what you like and why you like it it still takes me time I know it a lot better now what I like and why I like it than five years ago but I'm still learning every day mm-hmm. the way is using space between lines and changes yeah that's cool oh, and what's the way how would you describe the way he's using space between the lines and changes i know i i'm i'm kind of a pain in the ass if it comes to uh so i just try to to go in deep in the idea of um hi nervous i uh remember you from last week right good evening uh how are you how's your taste in music <laughs> no <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's basically what you're trying to discuss now, how to widen your taste in music and what you can do also to really get more open to a lot of music and to your own taste, discover your own taste. I, how much would be the percentage, uh, Timothy, you think like when you talk to musicians, whether it's pros or non pros that actually can describe why they like what they like oh that's it kind of depends on yeah no i'll i'll i'll, I'll say a percentage maybe 10 percent. yeah sure it's of course not a it's it's, it's just a but it's it's like feeling of... the the um, the higher up you go in like level of musician or where they stand in their career or something like very advanced guys heavy guys they're the guys that can tell you why they like it and what they like exact like to the spot yes they can pinpoint like that's what i yeah and it can be you know really simple things it doesn't have to be um like i i don't know if it's really related but i i i remember this one iconic lesson by rob brune um in the conservatory rob brune is a trumpet player with the wdr big band which you might know i mean they played with everybody mm-hmm. at the last 30 years with the biggest jazz musicians so he played he played with with them all basically a little bit of a, a special guy, a really, really kind guy, a really nice guy. He um, he did a lesson. <laughs> it was a weird lesson. We had two hours of big band, and he started with, "Do you know famous jazz names?" And there was like a blackboard, and and he people threw names, and he started tried writing down like seventy percent of them. And I don't know, it went on for a long period as i remember like almost an hour or something and then he said like yeah these guys i i played with all all of them so that sounded a bit arrogant and like yeah okay sure yeah we know where you play with yeah so what's the point and he said his point was these guys they all played with attention they knew every note how to place them and how long a uh, quarter note was that was the point okay how long the quarter do you know how long a quarter note is like we have a chart we had a chart in front which we actually didn't play for longer than four bars or anything but uh like play the first note for me like like you do that for i, I was the lead in the section you do that and then the next guy of the saxophone section we all had to play one quarter note and then the trombones and the trumpets then drummer like that one like one kick on the drums one bass note we all did it and he said okay go home and practice a quarter note <laughs> because you cannot play a quarter note <laughs> um and it was a bit nuts kind of <laughs> but it's if 
it was really uh, dramatic being or at least how he, he, he brought his point home but I remember it to this day and I get it now at that time I thought he was kind of crazy <laughs> and what a, this wasn't a lesson but what it was a big lesson because um, a lot of people don't know how to place any note when they are improvising because they are in their head and they are trying to come up with stuff but it's all there but it's not really there it's kind of vomiting <laughs> it's kind of you know just throwing up throwing out ideas just spreading them and like it's it's there <laughs> but it's not really telling it, it's it's just like there is a ID, ID for you or there is an ID but the real good players is like this is the ID mm -hmm. and it's really hard to kind of 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 even um, better explain it but uh, that's intention it was like one big lesson on intention in one note but we never practice intention so much I didn't I don't know so many people who did do you, Timothy? Uh, not really. I I briefly practiced that, but it, it's it's like something. It's one of those things you should do more often, but you actually don't. But I don't necessarily know anybody who really focuses on practicing that or. You mostly, I think the, the the times I learned that is by playing mm. music and then mostly also playing with better musicians than I like. For example, when I play with uh, with with Mambissimo, we recently did a, a virtual big band uh, thing. But well, especially when we play live, we have some really really good players in there. Um, so I'm really humbled to play with them, but like Andy, Andy Hunter, who also plays WDR big band and like does also solos. And you know, you really hear he does. He is a he can aim everything he plays so well. And when that happens all around you, you kind of start to pick up mm -hmm. that intention. I, it's of course hard advice because now I'm basically say saying find the right kind of guys and hope they like like you can form a band or uh, they can play with you so that's maybe not the most practical advice um, my, but um, so if you can play with better uh, musicians as much as uh, you can if possible I, yeah so jam sessions it probably will happen uh, or I don't know which kind of jam sessions you are at but at jam sessions that's that's if you see like mostly people are intimidated by by good players and stay off the bandstand but that's exactly <laughs> the time when you should go on onto the bandstand and and ask for them to play with with you and and i would say 90 90 percent of them will play with you of there um and, um and maybe there is uh, a dude that is uh, <laughs> I don't know but uh, really go and, and do that and I'll read a few uh, we have some comments uh, coming in so a good audio system is certainly not bad I just bought my one myself because I literally was not playing any music anymore because I had a uh, old system and like the stereo function didn't work so one one monitor left panning worked and the other part of the uh, stereo sound didn't work and i really was not playing any music anymore because of that but on the other hand yeah 50 percent you say which could be true but uh it has to be decent like not like this like i i was like really feeling like i got a uh, wrong um, image of the music so I didn't want to get that mm. so I was just avoiding it so cancelling it so uh, make sure you have something decent uh, uh, yeah that really could help but it's also not that important at the, at the other hand if you're just having a decent option that's fine I think
Okay, nervous. So you're uh, starting to discover jazz and you're coming from uh, guitar and electronic music. Okay, that's an interesting approach because I, I feel a lot of like the crossover genres, mm. like also even Adam Neely is doing that, right? He's uh, he's doing a lot of like this electronic jazz of, or I saw on Instagram, they were recording a new album like that in the same studios as Nerf. So that's all kind of one um, uh, bit, bit of thing. So mostly it's jazz, initial jazz players going into uh, other like areas like the electronic stuff. But I don't know too much of like, like basically electronic music uh, or, or guitar players that are in like rock and then yeah, maybe rock, but like going like when I don't know how old you are, and that's not important, but let's say like when they are 25 and they have their basic, uh, yeah, stuff in, in electronic music and go then into jazz, it's probably a way different focus point mm. and approach, also. So I, I'm really, it's cool that you're also kind of uh, getting the conversation, uh, yeah, in, on yourself, like uh, in the comment section. I really like this. I like more, we like more uh, discussion or discussion is kind of a negative word-ish, but just a conversation yeah. about this more. It's more that. So we try to, to, to get into the, conversation because we feel a lot of people are you know divided in tribes almost mm. sometimes when it comes to music it can be really polarized and and like in in groups and and uh, in tribes and and it's really the jazz police and stuff like that it's really fun for me because when i was i was studying jazz um you know i have a way to poppy sound for jazz so i i, I get never asked not never, but not so much as for for um, quarantine gigs. But um, I am too jazz for pop, so I also don't get <laughs> asked for <laughs> for pop or rock gigs. Um, but that's okay. It's also not that I need to do that. Um, sure, not. I would, um, but but it's just a little bit of. Uh, that's where the polarizing sometimes, you know, happens. Um, On the other hand, then, for example, for I'm doing now a little bit in the, also with the Latin, this Latin band and Latin saxophone, it's kind of hard to find a good sub. Not that I don't think there are way better saxophone players than me and, and great jazz players, but just that kind of match the, the, the sound intention of that genre, mm. you know? So on the other hand, I think you yourself have this, even more than I have, uh, Timothy, a very unique blend of, yeah, inspiration and input. And now the output that is coming back is a very specific sound. Um, and which is, yeah, which is kind of a genre on itself. Guys, check his uh, <laughs> stuff out. He, he, uh, yeah, we didn't agree on this, but I'm, I'm a little bit advertising his yeah, it's guitar music, which is introvert, which is kind of metal. I would call it metal from probably that's the main subject, but it's totally not not metal like you would expect it uh, with a lot of classical influence, some jazz, not really jazz. But on the other hand, you can hear there is just there is nothing. It depends on what. Um, yeah what why you call jazz jazz i don't know it's not because of, like there is not a swing thing in or something but you know you can hear definitely also that there is some input because of the improvisation part which you took probably from jazz or something or but and the electronics we talked about and then so it's a really really unique kind of style um and i heard a lot of people here or I saw quite some people here saying they are trying to develop their own style and are working on their own style. 
and it can be a hard path to take because you're not really you're not getting asked a lot probably because you you have your own style which by definition is your own style and there is not so much other people that think like oh he would fit my band or something yes yeah no <laughs> so it can it can it, i know quite quite some people that are like you but also a lot of other people that are quite unique or really unique and they're like on every kind of different grade in the spectrum but um and the more unique or or they are about their own craft probably the less the least they get asked or something and that's a hard thing it's like you don't get the social recognition then but then the thing is you should you are the game you have a new game and then you should kind of try to communicate the rules of that game Mm -hmm. probably but that's your job then so it's also really not a problem if people are not asking you or something yeah, you, for then gigs or you're you're you are in the position then of asking people actually you're not mm-hmm. uh, if you know what i mean yeah <laughs> you're, sure. you're the one who has to yeah. pick the people and of course you can i have done plenty of of subbing gigs and stuff like that it's not like the one automatically excludes the other but it's no. it is a different mindset. Yeah, and the thing is, I, I just I wanted to mention this because I think you can easily become um, a little bit uh, discouraged by this fact mm. that that it's certainly in this beginning. If you didn't build yourself kind of this game, this clear game, and if you have a clear game, I think there will be always people that will be in it Mm -hmm. um but you have to build it clear yeah so that will be probably you need the time for that at school because you don't get asked for different (laughs) gigs Uh, (laughs) but (laughs) you should do that you shouldn't just put out music and expect people like to like it you should also i think a a part of it is kind of uh, explicit or implicit uh communicate what 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 the game Mm -hmm. is so and and then uh just don't get discouraged by the fact that there is and it's certainly not in the beginning a lot of appreciation maybe even i i remember so much this this brings something up uh timothy did um uh, yeah what what was it you did a guitar competition oh uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> you forgot about that yeah. we drove to amsterdam again um i i played to, yeah again <laughs> for uh, I played. To, we played actually Chromosome yeah. by Mike Stern. We had to play just one or two. No one. Two, two one. something like one. <laughs> yeah, one. Yes. Um, so long drive for one tune and then back. And the fun part was it. There were a lot of guitar heroes there. Yeah. I, I mean, I call them like that because like it's a little bit like uh, Jeff Beck. One was very good and he was also covering a Jeff Beck uh, thing. And and you know you have and one uh, Steve Fay. Mm uh song and a and a guy that could play amazingly in the style of, of Steve Fay and stuff like that. Uh uh so and Timothy came and we played Chromosome actually but uh, and and they knew obviously Mike Stern also it's not that he was the most jazz guy out of probably what came uh what the other candidates played but I I still remember what, what the jury said. Uh, he didn't win by the way. <laughs> Right? Or maybe I remember it wrong. What did they say, Timothy? That I should play more like Mike Stern. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which I thought like was... <laughs> it's so... It's perfect, right? <laughs> I mean, that's exa- That's the point, you know? I think you did a great job and, and you sounded the coolest because it was like, wow, you play Mike Stern uh, tune, but the solo is like you didn't expect you don't expect that and and then there, i think the jeff beck guy won no uh, i can't uh, remember could, could be play could play really great in the style of jeff jeff beck like he could really uh, it was like when you you closed your eyes it was jeff beck yeah it was a crazy experience and that was exact a good lesson <laughs> again uh 
how a lot of those comp- why you shouldn't do competitions. <laughs> no, <laughs> probably, but um, uh, but that's the it's cool that people um win those competitions because but that's you know that's the maybe you can become a good yeah a good cover guy of Jeff Beck song said that's great as well if that if you communicate that that's your game then I think that's really okay sure. but that was not your aim <laughs> so it's kind of I think actually it was still the best co- comment or uh, yeah to get from the jury <laughs> only they didn't they didn't think so 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 yeah, um, there is a lot to still yet discuss about this topic, um, but probably we kind of should wrap it up somewhere. Um, so, or you have some thoughts or ideas, uh, Timothy? I see you thinking. A lot of thoughts and ideas, but uh, I, sure. I think that's that's there, good to continue is... on, a, on another. <laughs> night <laughs> yes um yeah which we will do next week we we are doing this now still for the rest of the year on the coming sundays around the same time guys that will be we are european so that's our 7 30 in the evening but if you're from the east coast uh, new york time zone that's six hours earlier that's 1 30 p.m if you're pacific time zone that's 11 thir- no 10 30 mm-hmm. yeah look it up yourself <laughs> no just <laughs> just uh wherever you 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 live uh i know we have quite a lot of subscribers from the states so we put that uh we cannot put every time zone <laughs> in, in there unfortunately but we are we are um we are here again around the same time um and we kind of use then one frame like one no this time it was about musical taste and how to widen it which is i think hugely important if you want to be creative it's okay to to cover uh, music that's that's perfect too but um this was a little bit more about the creative process of your own music profile uh, but we did some about transcribing more in that area, which we do a lot, of course. But it kind of all, <laughs> you know, the trans- transcribing makes sense because we want to discover our own taste. Actually, that's it's all coming together mm-hmm. somehow. So, uh, so thank you, George, um, uh, for for joining us. Hopefully, you guys join us uh, join us next week again. Leave us also if you have thoughts of a good subject to to uh, to talk about. Surely drop that in the comments. Um, we have some ideas, but we would love to know other ideas as well. Um, yeah, that's it. I think. Yes, Timothy. I think so too. Then uh, we'll be off for now, and uh, you can expect, of course, a new transcription tomorrow, like <laughs> like you. You could expect for the past three or four years already on every Monday. Like clockwork. Uh, it's very, very, yeah. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Hopefully see you next week. And if you have also just random questions about <laughs> music, best. Uh, <laughs> that's our uh, expertise. You always can. Uh, it doesn't, we don't need to keep to the, to the topic. We, we just, uh, put up there yes. so it can be an open forum for music and uh, transcription and anything music related so cool guys have a great evening or day wherever you are and see you next week yes. bye bye bye